troubling discrimination and racism that is happening in this country, I need to use these tools that I'm learning in graduate school to do something about it. So I switched gears, and after graduate school, I spent one year uh, on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., working for then Congressman Mike Honda, who at the time was the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. Now, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus is a, a group of members of Congress that care uh, about Asian American Pacific Islander issues. They themselves are Asian American Pacific Islander or have a large constituency of Asian American Pacific Islanders in their, uh, in their, their districts. So while I was a fellow on Capitol Hill, I, I essentially served as a liaison between the, the caucus, Congressman Honda, and a number of national Asian American and Pacific Islander groups uh, that were working to make things a little bit better for people who look like you and me. Um, and I found that I really enjoyed doing that work. Uh, and so when I came back to California, uh, I decided to continue doing that, the advocacy work on behalf of uh, communities of color, uh, worked in a number of nonprofits, uh, doing this work and helping underserved communities, uh, worked on um, policy at the federal, state, and now local level, and currently I serve as the policy director of the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits, which is a local nonprofit trade association here in the Bay Area. Uh, but that experience in Washington showed me, wow, there aren't many people who look like you and I roaming the halls of Congress, are there? No, you can probably count the number of people who look like you and me on your hands. Um, and so I also, for my time in DC, recognized that if I wanted to, to really make an impact, it's great to, to be behind the scenes and informing policy and making recommendations, but in order for real true impact to be made, I have to be part of the conversation, be at that table, helping to inform those decisions that have a really uh, real impact on the lives of people we care about. Uh, and so that's what led me to run for public office, and we can talk about that in the next set of questions, but that's a little bit of flavor for advice for me. I guess we're going to do this again. I'm going to I think that's the first time we've done Patrick? Yeah, so first of all, thank you all so much for having me today. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, my story. So I grew up here. I actually grew up predominantly in the city of Santa Clara. And um, I'm the first in my family to go to college. Uh, I grew up very poor, and parents struggled quite a bit. Uh, neither of them graduated high school. And I found myself going to De Anza Community College, and I wasn't like any of you. I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to join any community service clubs. I just wanted to go to community college and transfer to a four-year university and go on with my life. And I got a parking ticket one day, and I was pissed. And all of the parking permit machines on campus were broken. And I couldn't afford a parking, uh, a monthly or a quarterly pass. So I was doing these daily, but I could never find working daily parking permits on campus. And so I marched into the police department and I said, you shouldn't be ticketing students if all of your machines are broken for your permits. And they just kind of laughed at me and said, if you want to change something, you can just go run for office. So that's what I decided to do. And I marched into the student government office and there was a student trustee position uh, open. And I ran because I was pissed off at the police. <laughs> and I won. <laughs> it's a good platform these days. Um, and I found myself getting more involved because I loved my community college, but I could see a lot of problems on campus. And I wanted to get involved because I wanted to fix them. And I knew a lot of the challenges that a lot of people who are the first in their families to go to college face. Um, issues weren't going to be addressed by the time I was done. I knew that it was going to be four or five years down the line. 
Um, I got progressively more involved. I met with uh, several student leaders on campus. We we're talking about reducing our carbon footprint and we should all tax ourselves to create a green pass on campus to have free bus uh, and light rail uh, to, in order to get efficiently to school. And everyone, I sort of graduated at the height of the recession back in 2007, 2008, and no one wanted to tax ourselves, but uh, we pushed, and one of the things about what I've learned through Apolly and a lot of other organizations about community, and I have power because I have relationships with stakeholders and community members, and that's where we get our power from, right? It's not about collecting power for myself, it's about utilizing our shared interests and connections to advance what we want to see accomplished. And several years later, we finally passed what is now known as the Eco Pass that every community college in Silicon Valley has, where you pay a small fee and the whole bus and light rail is now free for all students to use. That was not an idea that came from the administration. That was not an idea that came from the faculty. That came from students. And there are so many more great ideas that students have because they have to live and breathe the educational system. So they know where the cracks uh, fall. They, they know where the issues arise. And um, I got progressively more involved after that. And I got really interested in policy. And there I met uh, then uh, Mayor Evan Lowe, who was the youngest uh, mayor in the country at one point. Um, first openly LGBT mayor, uh, youngest mayor in the country. And was very inspired by how young he was uh, how bold his progressive ideas were, and uh, kept in touch with him. I transferred to UCLA, uh, and from there, I went to Washington, D.C., uh, like Wendy. I worked for Congresswoman Janice Hahn from Los Angeles, and I graduated, again, the first in my family to go to college, graduated from UCLA. UCLA. I had $600 on my bank account that was supposed to last me all summer long. And I took, I bought a one-way ticket to DC because I couldn't afford a return ticket. And I told myself, I'm gonna find a job. There's 10,000 interns on Capitol Hill that find try to find jobs every single summer. And I started working for uh, an office for about a week. It took me about a week to figure out how to transfer phones correctly without accidentally hanging up on anyone. And I went and helped uh, a newly elected Congresswoman Janice Hahn, uh, who won in a special election, so she was the only game in town that was hiring people. And I was like, that's it. I'm gonna get myself in front of her and get this job. And I, you know, sort of they thought I was amazing because I knew how to transfer phones. And I didn't tell them that I had just learned that. But, you know, you, you gotta fake it till you make it sometimes. And that kind of confidence is, I think, not said enough because if you sort of possess the will to just figure out the problem, you may not know all the answers, but you know how to find the answers. And I think that is that was huge and very formative in sort of my journey. And Janice hired me after my second week. And that wasn't because I went to UCLA. It was not because I was very good at policy writing. I actually am a very good writer. Uh, it was because she had back-to-back -back meetings all week and she didn't have lunch. And I offered her my granola bar, which was my, my lunch. But this, I tell you all that because it wasn't anything amazing that you have to do. You have to think about someone else for one second and think of and anticipate someone else's needs. And whether that be a, a career in politics or policy or the private sector, that kind of transcends because a lot of people, um, when you graduate college and go out into the workforce, there's a lot of selfish people out there. And you know, we, uh, 
we are structured our economy in a way that's very capitalistic and, and in some in some ways, uh, you know, greedy. And I cannot tell you how rare it is and how much you will improve if you think about other people and what their needs are. Could be your boss, could be your supervisor, could be your colleagues. Um, that is going to shine because innately people don't necessarily do that. And I offered her that and she said, you're the first person to have offered me anything my entire week in Congress, you're hired. And she had a meeting with Nancy Pelosi after that and I said, sure, I'd be happy to take her there. I had no idea where Nancy Pelosi's office was. So I called my intern supervisor and I, and I wrote down on my, on my wrist uh, the hallways on how to get there. And I got to have a meeting with Nancy Pelosi and my boss. And that's kind of how I kind of ended up here. I stayed in touch with assembly member Evan Lowe. Um, three years later, I decided that Washington DC was about enough for me. Uh, and I realized very quickly that change does not come from Washington DC, it comes to Washington DC. And like Wendy, um, I wanted to learn what Apolly taught me and what Deanne's college taught me about community organizing and that our power comes from community. And that's what I love so much about politics. I love the people and I love the grassroots and the power that that instills. And so I packed up everything that I owned in my Toyota Prius and drove across the country. Felt like I was in Texas for about a week. No, that place, that, Texas is very large. Like, has anyone been to Texas? Like, Texas. Just like, Drive all day. it just, you just, it just yeah. keeps going and you're still in Texas. <laughs> and um, after I finally got out of Texas uh, and made it to California, um, I started working for a uh, local assembly member and then when my, my current boss, assembly member Lowe, got elected, uh, he hired me and now I'm his district director and in charge of his district office. And I've loved community organizing ever since. And I want to make sure that you are also the Puerto Rican Community College trustee. Is that right? Yes. Oh, yeah. I ran for office and I won. <laughs> and so now I'm on the community college board, the very board that I was the first in my family to graduate from. So it's an incredible experience to be able to find a way to give back to the community that gave me so much. I know that sounds very cheesy, but like it's true. Like I have so much love for this community college, for Anthony, for Wendy, and for all these other people who constantly put other people's needs ahead of their own. And that's, I think, the community college experience. And I want to be a part of that. And I had a wonderful experience at community college, but I know not everyone does. And so um, I was able to, growing up very poor, navigate through the system fairly easily because of my privilege. And I recognize that. And my experience should be everybody's experience, and it's not. And so I want to get on the board. One of my major initiatives is I want to build affordable housing on every community college campus in, in, in the state because I think we need it. And so, more on that later. Thank you. Um, so a little bit of background for both sides to know what's going on. So, um, CIUSA uh, has uh, funded, a grant, you know, funded a lot of internship programs. So a lot of folks here are interns who do working in public services. Uh, so why the reason why we have you two here is also to share us a little bit of your experience in public service, particularly in legislative staff, but also, and we'll get to later about like what it means to be a public official, right? But the question, first question I have is, um, please share with us your experience as a legislative staff. Um, who will be a good fit for this role? How can we prepare? Um, and some part of your story would be great. So I think Patrick uh, hit it right on head and that I think one key thing you need to remember in public service and really in, in any facet of your life is to, to be empathetic and to anticipate the needs of others. Um, I can't tell you how many times when I was working for that congressman in my conda and you know I would make sure to have extra snacks or a bottle of water with me just because 
as an elected official, and particularly as a member of Congress, you're constantly on the go, and as Patrick noted, you don't always have time to be. And so um, being able to anticipate the needs of those that you are working with is, is huge and will carry you along the way. Um, in my experience working on Capitol Hill, it can be a very fast-paced environment. Um, every day is different, so if you kind of like doing the same thing day in and day out, hmm, maybe working on the Hill is not for you, but there might be other public service jobs that uh, where you can do the same thing day in and day out. Uh, I think one of the greatest strengths uh, I've seen in having been in the public sector for a while is and what is really valued, what I look for in my interns is their ability to think on their feet and to be flexible because uh, our circumstances are constantly changing. Um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, being in my office and in, in my day job and we get a call from a local nonprofit that has an issue uh, and we have to absolutely drop everything we're working on because that is the most important issue of the day. Uh, we have to be able to, to pivot quickly and be responsive to the needs of um, our community. Um, and I think one other other skill that's been particularly helpful uh, in kind of a legislative role has been the ability to take lots and lots of pieces of information and distill it down into something that is digestible. Um, especially if you're working for an elected official, they have to know a little bit about a lot of different things. And if you're going to write a 15-page paper about some issue, your elected official boss won't have time to digest that. And so I got really good really quick at writing very succinct one to two-page memos, summarizing the issues, giving relevant data, writing talking points to make my boss sound like he was an expert um, on the issue when he maybe knew that much about it. Um, and so that technical writing and the ability to analyze information very quickly, um, I think as a skill set, that is, uh, pays off um, that leaps and bounds. Yeah, I just want to just clarify that. So you're saying that someone who is quote unquote lower level has so much influence on someone who is boss to make sure that they look like an expert. So someone like an intern has a lot of ability to influence and make an impact. Absolutely. Uh, one thing you'll find in public sector work and community work is that there's never enough time to do all the things you want to do. Uh, and you're always under resourced. You're always trying to make a dollar stretch. Uh, and you're trying to, to, to basically create new mountains with time budgets. Uh, and so the ability to, to work quickly and deftly uh, is, is absolutely vital. Um, Uh, and so you may think, oh, you know, who am I? I'm just sort of the lowest level intern on the job. But you all add value in your own ways. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. What you are doing is, is a real public service. Uh, and uh, you, I, I can't, I, I'll, I'll tell you, having been an intern myself, having worked, worked as a legislative fellow, now supervising interns, um, I never give any of my interns something I wouldn't do myself, right? Uh, because I feel that this is as much of a learning opportunity for you as it is for me. And I want to be able to develop that next set of leaders that are going to have the skills to be effective leaders in their community. Um, and, and so, you know, yes, yeah, sometimes there are going to be any tasks where we're having to set packets, right? Or make name tags. But in my job, my day job, in a nonprofit, everyone from the CEO to our interns are doing work. Um, because we are often under-resourced in this work and everyone needs to pull their own weight and contribute and be part of that team in order for all of us to be able to do this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think, I think, all of you would be very well equipped to be uh, on legislative staff. It is the honor of a lifetime. It's very addictive work. And I think that, uh, as Wendy mentioned, there 
is always work to be done. The work never ends in public service because the, the community and the public need you. And they need government to be more nimble and responsive. And as you all might have read in the news, it's not always that way. And we need better leaders <coughs> representing us in, in office, and we need better legislative staff. Uh, we are we are called to a public mission, and it is addicting the type of work that you get into and the impact that you can make uh, with individual people. I just had uh, two weeks ago. I helped uh, this recent uh, immigrant come in and get their driver's license for the first time, and he was having a lot of trouble with DMV. He was losing their paperwork couldn't get his license, I, I just picked up the phone and, and, and called them and I, I straightened it out. And this grown man started crying in front of me, saying now that he can run his plumbing business legally without worry, getting worried about being pulled over by the police and harassed. And that's, you know, it's, it's a very humbling feeling to have someone cry in front of you because of the work that they did. And it's not always that tangible, but that's why we are here. Like, it should, the system should have worked for people, and so much of it is broken right now. Um, but it, being a legislative staffer is, has been the honor of a lifetime, and it will take a lot out of you. It will take your personal time. It will take a lot of your free time. The demands of the job are incredible. But I have gotten to meet President Obama. I've gotten to meet Secretary Clinton on numerous occasions. I've gotten to meet Anthony. Uh, you know, <laughs> my name is after Obama. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, th th those are like the highlights that I'll always remember, right? Like meeting these incredible people in public service. But I also got to meet, you know, Stanislaw, who I helped with his driver's license. I got to meet and help um, Erin get health care for the first time in her life uh, through the Affordable Care Act. Like, you, you get to help people survive. You get to help people improve their lives. And it's not a, that like that every single day, as when you mentioned. Some of it can be mundane, uh, especially if you're starting out as an intern. You can sort of question, being you know, like, why the hell am I, like, answering phone calls, can I transfer the phone properly? Like, a lot of that is foundational work to set you up for the next big thing. And we are all part of this ecosystem. And, you know, and also to one new point, like, I hope none of you want a nine to five job. That is my hope for all of you. I hope that you don't just want to go and punch in your hours and go home. Like. You're all civic leaders, and leadership. What is what does civic leadership mean uh, to me and Wendy? It means putting in as many hours as it takes until the job is done. Uh, being a leader means showing up early to events and then cleaning up afterwards. And, and being the last to leave. And being the last to leave, and that is where the most improvement is made and the, and the most growth is accomplished. And so, kind of like capturing the theme, what I'm hearing from both of you is that uh, <coughs> those who are adept, they're quick to adapt, um, who have a real heart in public service, this is a great spot for them, right, to do this. Kind of and I hope that question was articulated enough to understand, <laughs> to be understood. Um, so thank you so much for both of you. Um, I want to do a quick little section where are there questions from the audience? Uh, I know some people were engaged. I know some people's eyes lit up when they heard the word Obama. Um, <coughs> any questions? I see a pan back there. I know that's all I see. Um, my question is. Wait. Okay. Yeah. Honor yourself. Um, my name is Vidya. Uh, I just like snuck over here from the other group because I wanted to be here more. Um, <laughs> but. Um, my question is, you talked a lot about the kind of people who stay and who make 
good interns, what are the kind of people who go quickly that you saw like rotate through really fast? Oh, God, I, I, I think Patrick probably has a lot more experience in that. I defer to you on this one first. Well, um, public service is not for everyone, right? In fact, it has such often a bad rap is because bad interns become bad people become bad elected officials. And if you sort of watch on TV the crazy people that are in office right now, chances are like they were an intern when they were your age. And uh, in terms of the, the people that sort of quit altogether to answer your point, like I I can only name a handful of people who started my cohort, my, my congressional internship cohort, that are still working in, public, in the public sector. A lot of people take one look at what it means to be a legislative sapper, what it means to be a public sector employee, and they get out, right? For a variety of reasons. It could be they don't want to spend four hours past five o'clock. They want to go home. They want to go watch baseball. They want to go make money. They take one look at our paychecks and they start laughing, right? They, they get, someone lies to them, and that happens often, because there are a lot of liars in politics, especially right now, and they get burned on something, and they get so turned off by the toxic culture that working in the legislature or the public sector can be, right? Um, because the community doesn't have a very high approval rating of us, public sector employees, legislative staffers, politicians, right? They don't think very highly of us as in general. Um, and you know, there's a lot of folks that are really turned off by that, the negative. And, and there are people who say the only way you can get ahead is you, can, you have to be as mean and bitter as them. And you know, I disagree with that, but that's what some people do. Right? And so, um, again, variety of people. A lot of it is, for the most part, people get turned away very quickly, is it is not like what they expect. They think it's ribbon cuttings. They think it's speeches. They think it's kissing babies and shaking hands. And all of that's great and part of the job. But that is just one little aspect of what you see. The majority of legislative work elected official work is grueling hours, underpaid, long board meetings, long board meetings. Um, they call it board meetings for a reason. And, uh, and, you know, so it's not any one thing that I think turns people off um, from these experiences, but I think people find out very quickly, oh, this is what it's like? No thanks. I'm, I want to go be a business, you know business administration, go make money or something. I'll just add. I mean, I, I think it's really just the antithesis of everything that Patrick and I just talked about. Right? It's people who are putting themselves ahead of the community that they're trying to serve. Uh, they they think that it's going to be all rainbows and butterflies and, and glamorous, when really it can be very poorly um, work. Uh, it, I mean, it's absolutely gratifying work, but it's not for everyone. Um, if you're not willing to put in the sweat equity, um, then this, this, this type of work is probably not suited for you. If you are completely self-interested and are looking for a personal gain, this is not the, the sector for you. Uh, because we, I mean, it's, it's in the name. We are here to serve the public. Uh, and if that is not your interest, uh, if you don't want to make a, a difference in your community by putting in that sweat equity, uh, perhaps you should look elsewhere. I mean, I, I definitely have had interns that um, have been very lazy, uh, have just not been interested in kind of the work that we do, um, as much as I try to excite them about, um, you know, doing some budget analysis. It's not for everyone, I get it. But I, I think. <laughs> um, but I mean, being able to link what we do to kind of decisions and the impact um, that's being made is, is certainly helpful, but sometimes it takes a little while for you to understand how you're adding value to the bigger equation. Thank you. Um, question. Hey, Mike. Um, so I know you guys do a lot of great work, like 
for the public and it's great to service and very gratifying inside. But how do you guys prevent yourself from growing out physically, mentally, and financially? I don't know. I'm all of those things right now. Um, no, that's a great question. Um, it's, I think, something that Wendy and I are still struggling to find that balance. Again, I think we've been at this for the long haul, and I think in some aspects, whatever we do in our lives, we want to do this kind of work. Uh, but it's extreme. We've had to learn the hard way, I think, because there's been times where I've been completely burned out, completely stressed. Um, uh, about a year and a half ago, I um, finally acknowledged that I suffered from extreme anxiety and depression. And that's not something that you want to talk about as an elected official, that you have mental illness. And it's very, very stigmatized. And, you know, just because I have that doesn't mean that I can't be any uh, better of an advocate or any worse of an advocate than anyone else. Uh, but speaking to those problems, what I have found is acknowledging your limits, finding your limits, pushing yourself, because you can be just incredibly amazed at what you can see, what you can accomplish, and what you think you can accomplish. But a lot of it's acknowledging and being honest with yourself and other people and realizing that as soon as I sort of talked very openly about my struggles with depression and anxiety, that I had the most overwhelming support. I thought people were gonna want me to resign from office, resign from public sector life, uh, and that could, very well have been true at a certain point in our in our country's history. But I think that I'm I think we're really fortunate to live in a community that doesn't really care um, about those things. They want to see what you can do. They want to see what you can do for them, for the community. And uh, part of it's just testing your limits and testing the boundaries and also acknowledging um, when those limits are enough, and saying no, and saying no to your supervisors, and, and saying, no, I can't work the fourth weekend in a row, like, I have plans. And that's not gonna ruin your career if you say no. The power of no is great. I say no to people all the time now. It feels good. Uh, it did take me a while, right? But you earn that. You earn, you earn the power of saying no, because you can't just say no to things whenever you want to. I think it's about, you have, you know, one very valuable lesson that someone told me uh, when I first started was that once your reputation goes in pu the public, you can't ever get it back. So what do, you, what, do you, what do you want your reputation to be? And I want my reputation to be a hard worker, obviously, and I think I have accomplished that. And so when someone comes to me finally and says, can you work this other weekend, can you come volunteer for that? I have to say no. You know, obviously it's disappointing in that moment, but they know my body of work and they know my commitment. And so if, as long as you have shown that you can put in that work, it's more than okay to say no and make boundaries for yourself. So this country that I have mentioned, this, this work is not for the fan of It really is a marathon and not a sprint. So, if you think about it, it's like you have to, how do you train yourself to run a marathon? Right? You have to set those boundaries. You have to give yourself those periods of rest. Um, and it's not often easy to say say no. Um, and it is a continuous work in progress. Uh, it's something that I and Patrick always have to work in. And in fact, I usually like Patrick. What are we doing? Like you, you need to like take a break. <laughs> you need, and it, it, it is something that it, it, it is a definitely a learned skill. As I've gotten older, um, I've noticed recovery for me takes a little bit longer, not as sprightly as I used to be, and I acknowledge that. Um, and I listen to my body before. Uh, there will be days when I was younger that I'd work easily 12, 15 hours regularly. Now, as, uh, as I'm a little bit older, I'm like, no, I am in a different season of my life. I appreciate having free time. I appreciate being able to make connections with, with friends that I haven't seen in a while, and I'm going to place that, that down. But it's 
only because I've developed that body of work that, that Patrick talked about, that people know I put in my time, I, 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 I've always followed through, and I earned this time for me. And I think that's the other thing, is to not feel selfish about taking that time, because your body, we're not, if, even though we do invisible work, we are self not uh, and remember that this is a marathon. We need to continue con to con condition ourselves for uh, if you want to, to have a long and story career on this book. So, thank you so much. So it sounds like with that question, now we're starting to get into terms of what's like to also be a condition. Um, is that the same right there? Um, <laughs> so, uh, in addition to what you shared before, right, and because we are hitting our time down to do this soon, I want to give our local folks here a chance to understand more. Is, you know, what is it that you tell us about your official life uh, that you may have not mentioned in regards to being a legislative staff? Um, so, I, I think as Patrick and I have noted, it, it, it is absolutely gratifying work. And, and for me, being a community college trustee, the best part of the job is sitting on that stage come graduation day and, and seeing all of our students walk across the stage and get their diplomas. It makes those long hours in the boardroom um, all, all worth it. Um, but again, this work is not all rainbows and butterflies. Um, and I, there are a lot of occupational, what I like to call a lot of occupational hazards. Uh, there have been a number of meetings where I've been, me and my colleagues have been yelled at. Uh, for something, some decision we made. Uh, I've been threatened by, uh, to be recalled uh, because people didn't like a decision that me and my colleagues made. Uh, but what keeps me going is that, you know, it's never been about me, it's never been about my ego, it's about the community that I'm trying to serve. Um, and if, what people don't tell you is that being an elected official can be extremely isolating. Uh, no one really understands the demands and challenges of, of being a decision maker and having a real impact on people's lives until you're in that situation yourself. And, and I think for me, what has not only sustained me in this work is one, kind of looking at those students on graduation day and remembering why I'm doing this work, and spending time on the campuses, including myself and the decisions that I'm making. But also, what has sustained me is having a, a, a close network of friends who are also in an elected office, whom I can vent to. I mean, Patrick calls me pretty regularly, <laughs> saying, how do I get through this issue? Uh, and to having that safe space, to having that, to have that sounding board, uh, because it can feel very isolating at times. Um, but uh, what gives me comfort is knowing that there are people uh, that I can count on, like Patrick, like so many of our friends, that are, are in the same boat, we all want to do good work. Uh, it's not often easy, uh, but it is incredibly meaningful uh, when you get to see the end product of work. Uh, and, and again, it is a marathon. Um, and so just remembering to find those bright spots uh, and always going back to why you entered this work in the first place uh, will help you over the long run. I think definitely, I mean, you know, serving on the community college board is a dream come true. Um, I've been wanting to do it ever since the police officer pissed me off, uh, giving me a ticket. And it's, you know, on a serious note, it's incredible. It's an incredible, awesome responsibility. And so often you have to make these gut-wrenching decisions that are very difficult and they're hard because uh, they're going to impact people either way. And to Wendy's point, there is a loneliness of being an elected official that I don't think a lot of people like talking about because there's this sort of understanding that as an elected official, you're supposed to have all the answers and you're supposed to have this perfect life and you're supposed to be well balanced and and represent the best of society and that's just such BS and what I found uh, in my experience as you know six months in office is you, you is true with any 
um, job that I have is you got to surround yourself with good people. Um, you're all in what college right now? High school. Okay, you're all young. Um, so, I mean, chances are the friends that you have now, a lot of them aren't going to be friends in ten years, and some of them, I mean, but. You're going to change, and they're going to change, and you're going to go through life, and they're going to move away, and you're going to move away. And it's really important to find people and not hold on to toxic people in your life, and to surround yourself with positive people who are there to support you and to lift you up. And you've got to do that as an elected official. You've got to surround yourself with people who want to make a difference, who want to make a positive impact, and people who can help you. And Wendy has been a, just an amazing friend and mentor to me uh, from her experience on the community college board and me calling her up and being like, I don't understand, why doesn't everyone love me? Uh, why are they yelling at me? Why are they mad at me? And I have a complex where I need everyone to love me. So it's like really offensive when they don't. And and that's hard, right? It's hard. Like, <laughs> No, I, you know, I want to be liked, right? And there's a lot of people who don't like me when I make certain, certain decisions on the board. And that's okay, right? It's okay. Not everyone's going to like you, you all either for the work that you do. Because guess what? You want to make an impact. And you want to change something. And by and large, the vast majority of people out there do not want to see change, even if it's beneficial to them, like, it's very scary for them. It is very, very, change is very scary for a lot of people in their personal lives and in their professional lives. And change can be an amazing thing if you have vision. And as an elected official, you have to have a vision for people. And you can't be afraid to tell people and articulate the vision that you have for your community. Because um, vision requires you taking a stance on something and wanting to change something. And that's going to ruffle feathers, but as long as more people want to follow you and, and go with the plan that you have set forth, then um, you'll be fine. And just, you know, ignore the haters. Haters don't hate at the end of the day, one way or the other. Um, so we are getting our time boundary. Um, I'm curious, both of you need to be able to have a time. Yeah. Okay. So the thing is, I want to have a little question for you. Um, but for you all, like, if you want to have any questions, you want to ask any questions, then we have about five minutes or so afterwards. So you ask some questions. Um, for example, why would you want to call yourself Supreme Chancellor? I don't understand that. <laughs> That's such a dark side chair that like Star Wars thing. Um, but this one. Yeah, it's nice to go no, I should not judge you right now. Um, but Oh right, 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 right. I'm curious. <laughs> Why am I still judge you right now? Like that? Um, well my question is, um, and we've been trying to include this idea of like leadership a lot more, right? Um, for you from your perspective, what is leadership? I mean, Wendy is leadership excellence. I think that um, Wendy has been able to articulate her vision for the community. And I think being a leader is not being afraid to go out there and accept the criticisms that come with being in a leadership role, right? Being a leader means that you're taking uh, more responsibility than other people in your group. And time and time, she's done that. And I think leadership excellence is being able to effectively carry out and demonstrate your understanding. One of the uh, first times I met Wendy, she was speaking at, a comp at, at, a, at an event. And I turned to my friend and I go, Wow, like Wendy is a really good public speaker. I'm like, I want to, I want to know how to be a good public speaker because I, I don't feel like I am. And he turns to me and says, it helps 
if you know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> and Wendy knows what the hell she's talking about. And from then on, you know, I've tried to, whenever I have to speak in front of people, I try to learn everything I have, I, I, I know about the subject, about the audience, about why you're here, because I want to know what the hell I'm talking about. And that's, you know, I think what excellence is. It is ruling, it is, you know, it is sort of looking at it from the, a, a, an athlete's perspective. Like, they win games because they train every day, not because of the actual match itself. Like, there's 90% of the work in leadership that people don't see, uh, and there's 10% of them actually seeing that leadership. Um, I think it's been, for me, leadership excellence has kind of been a recurring theme with the comments that, that Patrick and I have made, in that uh, leadership is service. Um, and, and there's this term called servant leadership, you, you may have heard of it. It's this desire to serve first. Uh, you just have this overwhelming sense to serve the community. And uh, what servant leadership means to me is leading by example, uh, serving community, uh, lifting others up, and really highlighting their strengths, and always being inclusive of diverse opinions, even if they are, are different from mine. I think I've done the most learning and growing as a leader when I've invited people who I don't see an eye, an eye to, to have a conversation and, and be curious right, about why they feel a certain way about an issue and trying to understand their point of view. It's made me a stronger leader. It's made me more informed and compassionate. Because at the end of the day, not everyone's going to agree with the decisions that Patrick and I are going to make. But if we, there's a willingness for us to learn and to listen, uh, that will carry you through. So with that said, can you all give me a round of applause?